Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media. And we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You want to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. 11.15, what is it? Thursday. Good morning. Thursday. Yeah, man. With a very special guest that was looking very much forward because he lives and works in a place that is, I would say, a very unique place. First of all, it's in Europe and it's a very unique place oh, to yeah. film wildlife, the Azores. Welcome, Nuno Sa. Thanks. Happy to have you. Where are you coming from? What was, what was the last thing you've been doing? I came about a week and a half ago from Malpelo. Oh, what have you been doing there? Uh, well, I've been shooting a documentary about Colombia. Well, I'm not shooting. It's, a, it's an international production and they hired me for a few stories there. We shot in, uh, also shot the, uh, the humpbacks in a natural park called Utria. Uh, it's pretty much a place in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the jungle, and there's a small bay where a lot of humpbacks come in with uh, their calves, sometimes even to, to have their calves, and uh, they stay there a few weeks. And we filmed there uh, in August, and now we went to, of course, to Malpelo because it's kind of the jewel of uh, Colombia underwater. And uh, we were doing the schools of hammerheads and all the normal stuff that everyone wants to see in these the places. Normal <laughs> stuff. The normal stuff that is your normal <laughs> thing that you do. Is that, do you do that for television productions or for what do you do it for? Well, I started, uh, I started as a, an underwater photographer and uh, then I started doing some video with these DSLRs and I kind of got amazingly lucky because I was in a very special place. The Azores is really kind of the Galapagos of the Atlantic and every year there's big productions going there, BBC, Netflix, National Geographic, whatever. And uh, when I decided to really get seriously into video, I bought a nice camera, I bought a RED, and uh, I just did a nice show reel to show people that I was starting to get into video. And I was extremely lucky because at the time we, uh, BBC was doing uh, Blue Planet 2, and uh, they hired me to do uh, a couple of stories in the Azores. And then that very, went very well. And I ended up also doing a story for them in uh, Norway with the orcas and the humpbacks where you guys have been. Well, you guys have been everywhere I've been. So. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't been to Malpelo. Yeah. Uh, no, not yet. No. That's uh. high on the list. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, then I got into the, the, the production market. So nowadays, I, I kind of, since I'm coming from the Azores, I kind of got this, this got out into the market as a guy that does big stuff. So I'm always hired for whales or sharks or something that you can have to maybe free dive and be flexible with and stuff in high seas and that kind of stuff. So would you say that your first step into this industry was not like a conventional step, but just happened by chance or by accident? Completely. My whole life was by chance. Uh, well, I, I think I, everybody's <laughs> life is kind of by chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took a law degree and I was... Well, when I finished my law degree, I was supposed to start being a serious lawyer. But uh, halfway through the course, I started diving and just really wanted to live in contact with the sea. And in Portugal, Portugal is a small country in Europe, but we have amazing islands. Azores and Madeira are really, really uh, amazing places with a lot of amazing sea life, but a lot of uh, things that haven't been told, haven't been discovered. So there's a lot, a lot a underwater cameraman or underwater photographer can show for the first time and so on. So I, 
I just moved to the Azores, just wanted to live in contact with the sea and started studying marine biology and, and working in the diving industry and in the whale watching industry. And then photography came in and then video. So I've just been going with the flow and Pretty interesting. I didn't have a plan. I still don't have a plan. For yeah, that. because we get the question a lot. Ah, yeah. you know, ask the professional guys how they actually start their career. And it's pretty funny because everybody sitting here is doing like the most amazing things. Basically started without a plan. Yeah. Morne, Hamburg, same thing. Andy Casagrande yesterday, yeah. same thing. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's what, what I hear everywhere. Uh, you just have to be lucky and open and open to grabbing experiences and opportunities life give, gives you, you know? Ah, that's cool. So th th tell us a few things. Why are the Azores an amazing place? Is it Azores or you say Azores? Well, in or Portugal we say, we, we say Azores. Azores. <laughs> but usually it's Azores, yeah. Uh, well, the Azores is almost in the middle of the Atlantic. It's on the top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And it's where you have th waters that are thousands of meters deep that just... Uh, basically, the Azores are the, the top of giant volcanoes. So all the ocean travelers, uh, this is pretty much the pit stop if you're crossing the Atlantic, the same way uh, Fayal is the pit stop for sailors crossing the Atlantic. This is the pit stop for everything big crossing the Atlantic, everything that's doing um, uh, Atlantic migrations. So it's an amazing place, for example, for whales. We have over uh, almost one third of all the species of whales and dolphins worldwide pass by the Azores, either all year or once in a while. Um, we have the blue sharks. The Azores is becoming very well known for diving with blue sharks. It's one of the top destinations worldwide for it. You have the mobler race. It's the, the only two places in the world where they actually mi uh, migrate and aggregate just on top of two specific seamounts. Uh, it's very rare to see a mobler ray, uh, a devil ray, a mobler terapacana, in, in high seas everywhere, anywhere in the Azores. But these two specific places, one is in Santa Maria called Ambrosio, and another one is Princess Alice near Pico and Fayal. They aggregate these huge uh, schools of maybe up to 50, sometimes up to 100 uh, devil rays, and it's, it's impressive. But it's just a very unpredictable place, you know? If you go out, you get hired to do a story about uh, sperm whales and you go out and you're gonna have fake killer whales attacking tunas or you're gonna have uh, you can have blue whales you can have fin whales you can have humpbacks you can have so many different uh, stories happen you can have these giant bait balls being eaten by tunas and dolphins and Korishi waters diving to 20 meters so it's definitely a place where a bit like South Africa you know a bit unpredictable wild and you never know what you're gonna uh, expect when you're going out that's why you have to have a bunch of stuff in your in your boat. Uh, you could you can have a you could go free diving, but you should have a pony tank and you should have a, a scuba diving tank on board just in case something else is happening. Cool, interesting. Let's have a look at some visuals. Sure. I think you've been yeah. working on a television series. Yeah. Uh, wh what I like to do is is work for productions and be hired as a cameraman because that's what I like to do. Be underwater and and filming, but the truth is in Portugal, no one is doing any kind of production related to the sea. And it's kind of um, a pity that Portuguese people don't know a lot about their sea life. So we started a big six part series about the sea life of Portugal that just came, it aired in November, 2019. The last episode was the 28th of December. And it was a monumental success and we had a really good sponsorship and uh, now we're getting invitations to do more productions about Portugal and uh, getting people involved about our sea life and about conservation. So although I thought this would be the only production I would ever do, uh, we're starting to have a few other ideas and we're going to do a few other projects. So this is uh, the trailer of our series that just aired a couple of months ago.
Was that last shot from uh, the sardine run? Uh, no, that's uh, bait ball in the Azores. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. That's crazy. It's, it's hard to get them, but uh, it happens quite a lot. Uh, a lot of, I mean, Netflix just released their, uh, what is it called, Our Planet series. On the opening episode, there's a big bait ball that was filmed in the Azores as well. Uh, Planet Earth 1 had this very famous sequence uh, of a big ball being eaten by giant tunas and dolphins as well. That was shot in the Azores. So it's, it's very hard to get. Uh, you have to get very lucky, but uh, it happens. What's your favorite, like, uh, how, oh, like, what's your favorite predator in these kind of bait balls? Uh, well, it depends on the bait. <laughs> uh, I love Norway. I like Norway is pretty much filming in big bait balls, but the bait ball is kilometers wide, you know, uh, because it's a lot easier and a lot more predictable and so on. Um, but uh, for instance, this year, uh, up to three months ago, we were filming uh, in Santa Maria Island whale sharks working together with tunas to uh, uh, eat bait balls. Uh, basically, the tunas make the bait balls, and then whale sharks come in and, and eat the, the, um, the bait balls. So, I mean, bait balls is like the perfect situation for a cameraman, because if you have to tell a, a whole story, it's all there, you know? You have different kinds of predators. You have how, how it happens, how they have to work together to make the bait ball and all that. And that's pretty much in common all the time either it's sharks or, or dolphins or tunas or orcas and with the humpbacks coming in or whatever. <coughs> I was just, th just thinking about, we were actually planning to ask you a few questions from the community, but I think as we've just been talking about the orcas, maybe we just have a look at your sure. orca video. Do you want to say something about it or afterwards or before? Well, it's, it's a sequence that uh, we shot for, uh, for Blue Planet 2 from BBC and uh, uh, no, not really. <laughs> it's yeah, pretty let's cool. have a look. <laughs> What do what do we see here? Can you can you say a little, talk a little bit about what we see here? Of course. Uh, so this is a behavior that now most of the people that go to Norway are pretty familiar with. But a few years ago, it, it, it wasn't very known that uh, the orcas had developed this special technique to, to eat the, the mackerel, which is basically doing this flip where they smack the herring really hard. And then the fish are pretty much either dead or very um, kind of unconscious or something. And then one by one they go and eat the, 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 the mackerel that they were able to, sorry, the, the herring that they were able to, to that, catch. I think that's very fascinating that they eat them one by one. Yeah. And that they even spit out like the bones in the head. Yeah, and the most amazing thing is they can't all go eating, you know? Uh, part of the group has to keep working of keeping the bait ball together. So they take their t eat, they take turns into okay. Now I'm going to eat. You guys keep working the bait ball, and and somehow this all works either by communication or just because they they know how to do it. And this behavior is just seen in Norway so far. Well, I'm not sure. I think so. Uh, the, the the amazing thing here is. We are, a lot of times what we saw was the, the orcas were making the bait ball. Yeah. And when the bait ball was made, then the, the humpbacks would come in from underneath and, and just swallow it. it. Yeah. And there was this kind of peace, peace and love underwater. <laughs> the orcas aren't attacking the humpbacks. If the, her if the herring wasn't there, they would probably eat the humpback. <laughs> but there's so much food, so it's enough for everyone. And that's uh, pretty amazing how they, they, they get along and, and no one's pissed off that there's so many <laughs> people eating this this massive bait balls the bait balls sometimes would be on the coast this is on the coast that's me diving there next to the whales and uh, it's pretty much a river of, of herring and uh, this previous shots were pretty much in the channel in deeper waters uh, most of the days we would have seven eight meters I was free diving here most uh, every day I was just free diving and we would have up to 10 meters maximum depth wow. here there's my, maybe five meters that's that's the me and my safety diver and that's an orc over there and all this back black patches all herring 
and this whole fjord was completely covered with herring. It's, it's, it's an amazing, I think this is one of those great spectacles, spectacles of nature that you can still find. And when I was there, I was kind of, this is like one of those places I never imagined I could be and, 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 and see. Filming all of this, free diving? Yeah, yeah. Is that the uh, shots that we saw in Blue Planet uh, 2? Yeah, this Is was on the uh, first episode, on the opening uh, episode, One, One Ocean. This is uh, all freediving? Yeah. Not yeah. a rebreather, maybe? No, uh, the only sequence we did, this Jeez. big bait ball that we were shooting underneath, I took a normal diving tank and not, not rebreather. And, um, but it's, it's fine to, to free dive here. It's, it's, the water is a bit chilly. The, water, the, the problem is lack of light. We had big problems with the lack of light because yeah. we had maybe three or four hours of usable light and we couldn't even see the sun. It was always behind the mountain. So for instance, I couldn't shoot uh, slow motion. Uh, we had to do it uh, at 25 frames per second. That's crazy. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> we thought we were lucky. But <laughs> Great. You, you dive on rebreathers sometimes? Yeah, I do, but uh, I haven't got very used to it because 90% uh, of the stories I'm hired for, you have to be super flexible. So typically on a, a shoot, I'll be using a freediving suit, a freediving configuration with some long fins and a sleek suit and having your lead on your, on your waist and being able to jump into the water to do whatever and then probably have some pony tanks on board so if you want to do a bait ball or something and then having a normal scuba diving uh, setup also just in case you have something that you have to spend more time in the water. But rebreathers aren't very friendly to jump into the boat, uh, yeah. back into the water, chase something. And, but um, I'm thinking of maybe trying to start getting more into rebreathers because we have a story that we have to shoot this year with big stuff with whales that are actually in one place and don't move too much which is in in uh, patagonia in the argentine side of patagonia with southern right whales they're very friendly they'll hang around you and interact with you and you can actually be just in one place and not have to chase them around so i'm hoping to get more more into rebreather diving but the truth is most of the stories i can't really use it that much Should we answer a question? Yeah, let's do it. These are all questions that were sent to us uh, by the community. And we take it the chance to ask you those questions, some of those at least. What do you feel is the added value of underwater videography compared to photography? And which one of both is the hardest to master? Is pretty cool because you've been starting with photography and then yeah. progress to videography. Well, in, in Portugal, actually, there was pretty much no one at the time doing any very serious underwater photography in the kind of documentary style. So I was always kind of a conservationist photographer and always trying to tell complete stories. And, and when you do that, you're pretty much approaching photography as a documentary, you know, when you're talking about the loose of habitat or the problems of this species and so on. So you pr pretty much have to do a, not one beautiful picture, you have to do, get into storytelling and tell a whole story. So it's not, not that different at all, I think. I think each of us are very, uh, photographers or videographers are in a perfect situation uh, to, when you do a beautiful picture, you have people that are looking at this picture and they're creating a, emotional relationship to this subject and all of us have the responsibility i think to take advantage of that if you if you're having people looking oh this is so beautiful this is so amazing why not tell the whole story why not say okay these blue sharks we were seeing it's the, the most fished out uh, a shark in the world. It's the number one sh species being exported to, to China because of its fins, so on, just as an example. So I think uh, that we all have this kind of obligation of taking advantage of us, of our opportunity to speak out for nature. So I don't think photography and, and videography, if you look at it that way, are pretty similar. Of course, videography, when you're doing it for documentaries, you're only in the storytelling business. And constructing a narrative is 
a lot more difficult than taking a, a beautiful picture. That's what I feel. You have to dedicate a lot more time and, sure. and a lot more logistics. So uh, I would definitely say photography is a lot more hobby and uh, if you really like for taking pictures and being at the sea and doing something nice, it's super cool. Uh, but if you want to get into videography seriously and produce a documentary or something, it's a lot, a lot, a lot harder. <laughs> it's a lot uh, of pictures really more. Yeah. <laughs> do you also do editing? <coughs> no, I don't at all. How does it feel? Like you shoot something well, and I you feel probably have something in your mind about <laughs> it, you give it away and then something comes it's back and you go like, really guys? Is yeah. this what you made out of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love having as many directions as I can, having a storyboard, having, usually if it's a big production like BBC and so on, the producer will g actually give you his dream list of things that he wants to happen. They usually don't happen, but uh, <laughs> you have a, uh, how they want to, you have an approach of how they want to tell the story, and they'll actually give you a shooting list with <laughs> uh, wide angle shots, a medium, a close up, uh, what, what details to, to focus on, and so on. So that's a big help. But of course, in the sea, nothing ever happens how you predict it's going to happen. So you have to really adapt into being able to tell a story and um, just be able to understand the language that they're going to be using when they're cutting this. Because, uh, and I think it's a big, I, I would love to be able to edit. I don't. And uh, I, I don't, uh, never, I'm not a very technical guy, and I've never had the time to dedicate myself to that. But it's a, I think it's a huge advantage if you edit as well, because then you're used to cutting a story and, OK, I still need this shot and I still need not that shot and so on. But it, the most important thing I, thing, I think, is to really understand what kind of language they're using. You know, you see documentaries when everything is very aesthetical, uh, aesthetic and slow motion and beautiful lighting. You see a lot of documentaries that it's the opposite. They want action and they want confusion and chaos and action shots and so on. So each documentary, usually, you really have to prepare what it's going to be used in, in, the, in the global, in the big picture. <coughs> Nico is asking, I just want to know how often you adjust all the camera settings. White balance, aperture, ISO, shutter, underwater. Sometimes you see something you want to film and before you got all the settings right. Um, like, do well, you for me, that's the easiest question of all because I, yeah. I use a, a red camera and I do not touch any setting. It's a fully manual camera. I do everything manually, focus, uh, aperture, whatever. But... Uh, the, uh, a very important thing is when you have your own rig, I have my own rig, so I really adapted my rig to, I use a lot of uh, assignable buttons that are pre-programmed for different things, and uh, I don't touch ISOs, I don't touch uh, resolutions, I don't touch anything uh -huh. uh, except the aperture and the frame rate. And uh, I have uh, assigned buttons for different frame rates, and that's very important, especially if you have a client that, uh, for instance, uh, BBC, they specifically, specifically ask you for different frame rates depending what you're shooting and how wide you're shooting. And, um, and then I'm just uh, touching the shutter button, which is um, just on the side of the housing. So I pretty much don't touch anything when, when I'm shooting. One important thing, uh, so he's, he was asking about shutter speed. No, well, he's, he, was, uh, he was basically asking about general. what settings right. or if you adjust your settings and I think... Right. One, one, one important thing is a lot of people uh, s spend a lot of time, lose a lot of time in the middle of the action uh, going to changing shutter speeds and, um, and uh, frame rates. And uh, a lot of cameras you can actually adjust your shutter speed not to a value but to uh, a degree, an angle, an angle and yeah. put it at 180 uh, uh, degrees. And that's a huge advantage because then you just have to ch change your, your frame rate. And um, otherwise, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have to go into menus and so on. But even easier is you, if you have assignable buttons, just put 1 to 25, put 1 to 30 if you use it, 1 to 50, 1 to 100, 120, and just push one button and everything is ready for you. And if you're in the middle of a bait ball, you just stop, 
push one button and recording again. Remember guys, yeah. 180 degrees is always double the frame rate. <laughs> Gives you the right motion blur. <laughs> We've been talking about the Azores. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and now uh, there's another uh, diving hotspot, uh, Madeira. I think you have like a short video uh, about it. Should we watch it sure, first and sure, then talk sure, a little sure. bit about the beautiful, is it an island or is it more islands? Uh, Madeira is one island, but it's an ar archipelago as well because it has several scattered islands. It has one, there is actually two inhabited islands, which is Madeira and Porto Santo. And they're completely different from, from each other. And maybe you can shoot the video and can we talk on top of this or not? Do you have sound on it? Just some uh, music. Can we do that? Can we talk on top of it? Can you reduce the sound of the video a little bit and we can talk on top of it? Okay. Yeah, cool. we can do that. If Sebastian's cool. saying we can do that, we okay. can do everything. <laughs> if he allows it, it's good. <laughs> because this is Madeira. It's a, it's a really beautiful island and it's, it has a, a small uh, marine reserve called Garajao. And inside this marine reserve, it's very easy to dive. This is Port Sant, which is completely different. It's like a giant beach. And here they have two world-class wrecks that are really amazing, really, really amazing. How deep? And <clears throat> now in Madeira, they just sunk uh, one of a, a ship on purpose for diving. These two ships have been sunk on purpose for diving, so at a perfect uh, depth inside, inside a marine reserve. So How deep? They are 30, 30 32 meters deep. Mm. So it's a good nitrox dive, uh, very, very cool with easy coming up, easy going down and a lot of sea life in there. There's big groupers, there's massive schools of, of uh, jacks, of uh, barracudas and so on. And um, the thing about Madeira is there's not a lot of fish outside the marine reserves or almost none, but they have amazing natural reserves. And this is a natural reserve where these two ships are. And I think these are probably some of the best wreck dives I've ever done. And um, in Madeira, you have also this nice marine reserve with big groupers and so on. And you have the chance maybe of seeing a Mediterranean monk seal, which is the <laughs> rarest seal in the world. And it's one of the most endangered uh, um, sea mammals worldwide. And uh, there's one place where this, there's actually a population, which is two small, three small islands called Desertas Islands. Desertas means deserted. There's no one living there, just some marine park guards. But it's closed for diving only for productions or natural history productions and so on. So you can't go there specifically for the, the, the seals. But the seals are coming back, so they show up. They, they actually showed up here in Port Sant for the first time ever last year, and they show up in Madeira. So you might get lucky and actually see one. If wow. You. And the visibility seems to be quite good. Huh? It's very good. It's usually 25. This is like 30, 30 meters of visibility. We did these dives when we were producing this series about Portugal's uh, sea life, and we took some scooters and so on. We were, this is the new ship that they sunk two years ago. It's a, a shi ship of the uh, Portuguese Navy. So you have all the guns and machine guns and all the stuff around. And it's, it's really cool because it's still pristine but full of life already. Wow. Yeah. Seems like we should go there. Yeah. <laughs> Add that to the list. Yeah. OK. Do you have a shot of the monk seal in there? No. <coughs> Okay, cool, good. Let's move on to another uh, question. Time is running as always, like super fast. I think uh, you have some yeah, questions from there. some live stream questions. Um, one of the more interesting ones is at the beginning, you were talking about how you created a show reel to get your name out. So from the conversations that we've had, they've had a very similar theme, like we were discussing at the beginning about being open to the chances that you get. Yeah. But you mentioned specifically that you had created a show reel. So in terms of advice for someone who's trying to get their content out as well, if they were to also create a showreel, what would you say in terms of advice in how to create the showreel, what to focus on? Right. Well, I think uh, most people uh, that approach me usually have a misconception that uh, there's usually like a, a track uh, that yeah. you should follow into One a career. One objective path. Yeah. yeah. And Everyone I talk with 
I think pretty much everyone I talk with uh, never got into video, uh, into being an underwater cameraman as a career. They, it's something that happened in their life. Yeah. Uh, Flo was talking about uh, Andy Randy Casagrande. He's uh, he was working in South Africa as a yeah. dive operator, and he worked with TV channels, and then he got into it, and yeah. now he's a, a, an amazing guy in in videography. So. I don't think there's a, a yeah. direct line into it, yeah. but I, I think definitely the best way is either one of two things. You either uh, make a really nice showreel, like these amazing videos from these guys called Behind the Mask that have these <laughs> beautiful <laughs> uh, <laughs> pictures and, and sound and, and, and everything, and that's one way, or you find the story, and that's another way, and that's even a better way, is if you're living in a place um, where there's stories that you think have never been told or could be could have been told in a different way, you 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 explore that story and you show you send it to BBC, National Geographic, Discovery yeah. Channel, Netflix, or whatever, and uh, maybe some of those stories have never been heard of before. Yeah, I mean, true. in the Azores, when I started in the Azores, I mean, there were so many stories there that had, no, I, I I photographed whale sharks there for for the first time ever or or basking sharks. It's the first and second largest fish in the world. And a lot of the locals there knew what they were there. The fishermen yeah. knew for 30 years that the whale sharks were there. And if you, if you go looking for these stories, there's probably, unless you live like here in Germany, <laughs> it's Cold. not too easy, but a lot of people travel yeah. to places or live in places where there's stories with amazing potential and they've been looking at it and diving for it with it for years and they know a lot more than the, the sure. team from BBC that went there for yeah. a week or, or the, even the scientists. A lot of times you, you even know a lot that, uh, that science haven't discovered yeah. yet. So that's probably the best thing is if you can find something that no one really has really yeah. heard about. Even if they don't hire you as the main cameraman, they're going to they're gonna hire you as a recce and maybe as a B camera or something like that. And so you'll get into, probably get into and the business. And then you work your way up. Of course. Yeah. True. And in terms of locations that you just mentioned, a lot of questions are coming about the Azores. So <laughs> I guess this is something that people are now discovering from this talk. So if you could advertise the Azores in terms of when to go and what you can expect to see if you go diving, because we've been getting multiple questions about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, the Azores is uh, influenced a lot by water temperature. Basically, the, the Gulf Stream passes south of the Azores, and when it comes further north in the summer, water gets warmer and a lot of tropical species come in. So I would definitely recommend coming in uh, between the 15th of July to late September, even okay. October. And then you have crystal clear water, you have warm water, uh, and you have more tropical species coming in. Uh, like the mobulas aren't there all year long. You'll, it's difficult to see them before mm -hmm. beginning of July, late June. The, even the blue sharks are a lot easier in the, in the summer. And uh, you have, I mean, these massive schools of dolphins and so on. Even the bait ball action is usually happening late spring, beginning of a summer, late summer. So I would definitely say 50, if you have just one shot at going to the Azores, go after the 15th of July until late September, awesome. October, and Good you'll find, find a lot of stuff. We'll plan our travels that way. <laughs> we, we already have. Yeah. We, we're going to be there this year. Yeah. Again. Cool. Another question. Joe is asking, I did some research of how people take underwater pictures and videos of orcas in Norway. Why most of you guys choose not to use video lights or strobes? <coughs> well, that's a good question, but uh, uh, I, I'm not too certain about... I, I wouldn't use strobes probably if I was doing photography. I, I've stopped taking photography, doing photography about five years ago. But uh when you're doing photography you have one great advantage which is you can pump up the iso and uh in video uh, most cameras most a lot of cameras except for like the alpha 7s2 you really can't pump up the the iso that much and not lose image quality uh lights i would never use in norway with uh, either with the orcas or humpbacks or even with the bait balls with the herring because it just doesn't look natural. You don't want a scene like this. The silver reflection is yeah. a little bit yeah. and, and you, weird. 
most of the big production companies will not allow you to use it because there's also the issue of the, if the animals will like it or not, but uh, it just won't look natural because first of all, the bait ball will reflect a lot of your light. The, the herring will reflect a lot of your light. If they come in, they're going to be super illuminated. They go away, they're going to be re really dark. And in a natural history documentary, it can be different if you're just looking to do d beautiful shots, aesthetically nice. But if you're into natural history, uh, behavior, storytelling, it has to look natural. That's why it's called natural history. And it doesn't look natural. With and the, it's with also not practical at all. Imagine, no, you know, yeah. and you be in and out of the boat all the time, yeah. Yeah. swimming a lot. Yeah, you know, and then you have like a lot of yeah, uh, definitely. drag through the water with <coughs> uh, lights. On it. So even if you, Joe, if you even try to do that, you will probably not going to do that more than one time, <laughs> because it's not practical. You're not going to end up getting anything usable. Okay, Thompson is asking: use lights in wide angle is a little tricky. Another light question: when you get poor visibility and backscatter, what is the best option in this case? I would say not to use light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't do, uh, I don't, well, for the stories I'm shooting, I very seldomly use uh, underwater lights, but I mean, if I'm in the Bahamas doing sharks, uh, tiger sharks or whatever, and we're a bit deep, we, you need some light to bring back the color. But you have to think of light not as something, unless you're doing night dives, of course, not something that's y illuminating your scene, but something that's bringing back the light, the, the, the colors that you lost because of the uh, refraction in, in, the, in the water column. I mean, at, at 20 meters depth, if you're not losing light, it's all going to be blue and green. That's true. But if you're going to turn on your lights, you're going to turn on your lights not to il illuminate the scene. You're just going to turn it on a very, uh, very low, very far from your camera, behind your camera. That's illuminating the whole scene. Uh, um, what you say, uh, uniformly? Evenly. Evenly, Smooth. evenly. And, um, and not using it as a light source. And then you're going to get all your reds and yellows and oranges back. But you're not going to notice that, that, this is gonna, that this is artificial light. You're going to have to use a light with a 5,000 tooth, well, with a nice co um, uh, color that, that isn't fake and that doesn't look like something's being illuminated here and something in the foreground is different. Okay, let's check this one here. Do you use underwater lights when filming large animals or ambient light? Does this affect your interaction with any wildlife? Well, I would say always use ambient light if you can get away with it. And if you need to put a bit of light, you put a little bit of light. Okay. What is this all about here? Well, this is a pretty, it's a story I like to talk about a lot because, you know, it's a, a, as I was telling you, when we were in Norway shooting for BBC, this happened the, 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 the next day we shot those th scenes that we saw with the orcas and the humpbacks uh, feeding and so on. This, this whale has lines all around her body and she was actually being pulled to the bottom. She couldn't even have her tail at the surface. And uh, we found this on the, the, the next day after we shot this scene that's on Blue Planet 2. And, and even in Norway, we were 300 kilometers above the, the, the Arctic Circle. And even here, you have the human Im impact. And, and you see that we are affecting the whole ecosystem and globally. And um, basically, here, I, I gave the, my camera to my uh, diving assistant. and took a knife and started cutting lines. This looks quick, but we actually, I stayed about an hour just trying to get it to trust me and let me go behind her. And she was a bit stressed, yeah. stressed when I was approaching her with a knife, which is kind of <laughs> normal. But she, gradually she let me start cutting lines along her body and so on. And um, it's, it's just, a story I like a lot because, first of all, it tells you how we're everywhere. The human being is having an impact on the oceans worldwide. It's not in, in uh, uh, heavily fished places or anything. 
actually this this whale after we released it the navy the norwegian navy came and they said they had already had six whales entangled only on this season so it's something that happens a lot because they don't they don't have echolocation so they can't detect it here i actually was trying to take these buoys away away oh. but she she tried to slap me on the head because she didn't feel comfortable not seeing me so i wanted to get rid of these buoys before I released her, otherwise these buoys would be on her for the rest of her life, but she wouldn't let me do that. So I tried diving deep and cutting it uh, from, from below, and this, this, this rope was pulling the whale down. As soon as I touched it with the, the knife, it exploded completely underwater, and like, like if it was made of metal. And she came up to the surface. And the, the, the most amazing thing happened after, after, this, after she was free because I assumed that she would swim away and, and she was probably fed up of being in the same place and was finally free. But she just came up to me. She stayed, I don't, I don't remember, maybe half an hour, one hour with me like this. Wow. And we, we eventually, I could take our, out the, the, the rope she had in her mouth. She followed us to the boat. And it just felt like she was really saying thank you or I don't know it's it's it, it really felt uh, a bit magical a bit I usually get a bit emotional when I'm watching this because it was a really emotional emotional thing and uh, it was not an emotional day because we had gone out drinking because we were celebrating the having nailed this this scene for BBC and then this thing happens and and it was such it was just crazy it was just crazy Do and in the end she let me be with her. I could, I could pet her or do, do whatever wow. she, I uh, wanted. And she, she followed me to the boat. I got out of the water because uh, the Norwegian Navy showed up. And they were, they were able to cut those balloons off with a special de device they have for this, which is a long rod with uh, some scissors. And finally, she went free and uh, never saw her again, I think. Did you have the feeling that she kind of knew what you were up to? Well, at the end, I mean, the, I, I, you, you just have to look at them as a really intelligent animal that understood everything that happened there. And, and I don't know if you saying thank you or whatever, or you just gained his confidence and he's, he's fine with you being... Because at the beginning, as, as when I started doing these shots, I got into the water, I did a few shots, and she was stressed. She was coming up to breathe uh, heavily and, and not very comfortable. So I just gave up on filming and pass the camera to another person. And, uh, no, but I mean, when you, when you get close to her for the first time, did you have the feeling that she's understanding that you actually try to like, free her from this? Not immediately. I think she was stressed and afraid and panicking. And it took a long, before I could cut the first line, I think I was 40 minutes in the water or something and being in front of her eyes and in front of her, in fr in front of her and then slowly going more be behind. But she wasn't comfortable at all if she couldn't see me. So uh, that's why she tried to slap me when I was yeah. uh, doing the tail. But uh, I think that's kind of normal if any one of us of was course, <laughs> sure. tied up yeah. in uh, and pa uh, struggling for their life. But I think what happened in the end is kind of hard to understand and hard to interpret. Um, is I she know. okay? I don't know. I, <laughs> I've never seen her again. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, did anyone say something about the injuries that she might get from uh, It this? didn't look like... The, the biggest problem was on her, her tail. It looked like this rope was eventually going to, to strangle her circulation and get into her, her flesh. And I've seen this. I saw this in Patagonia this year. Uh, a humpback swimming without her tail, but it had been cut off by a... Sorry, not in Patagonia. In, uh, yes, no, in Colombia. Um, the, they ha she had been caught up in a fishing net. We got a call from uh, some guys from the Marine Park and went to the place to try to release her and, and to film it. And when we got her, we saw, when we got to the scene, we saw her already swimming away without her, her, uh, her tail. So this can actually cut off the, the, the tail of, of the whale if, the, if it's not released. That's I think uh, you get an applause for that. <laughs> That's amazing, man. <laughs> you know, there's other stories about people, you know, jumping into the mouth of a whale and market stories like this. <laughs> I think this is, uh, 
we need this more is of real these stories. interesting yeah. things and I, uh, I I would not be surprised if you're going to meet her at one point if you go back to Norway cool. you know you always hear things like that that yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think they're much smarter than everything else I agree. on the planet wow okay the time is up Fantastic! It went f it went very quick. Yeah. It went very quick. Huh? <laughs> yeah, well, we, we still have a lot of things that we could actually <laughs> talk about. Hamdan, do you have anything else from the community? Yeah, there was one interesting question that uh, regarding the previous question we asked about putting your show reel up, and someone actually responded straight away and asked, in terms of film festivals, are there any certain film festivals you would recommend for someone who's looking you at? Not, show you're not actually doing that, do you? I've never been to a film festival. I usually go to uh, something that happens in Bristol, which is called Wild Screen, which is where all the big filming productions are, BBC, uh, Plimsoll, yeah. Silverback, all the, the, the biggest companies that produce for National Geographic here and there. They come to this mm -hmm. kind of gathering of people, and it's a really cool thing where there's a lot of, of this happening, yeah. meeting people, talking about stuff, and so on. I don't think it's a, it's a way to get into a market, but for instance, if you have a really cool idea of a natural history story that you know that's happening, there you, everyone related to the, to the filming business of is natural there, history yeah. is there, and you can actually ask for meetings with these people, and uh, there's actually a platform where you ask for meetings. So I would say making movies and competing in, in uh, these... Uh, these uh, film festivals is super cool and you will get uh, a name out. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to meet the people in the, in the industry, you really have to go to the, these more industry right. uh, guided uh, meetings. Yeah, yeah. I think Thanks that's a great lot. advice. Yeah. I really admire your mindset. Thanks yeah, a lot. <laughs> Thanks. This was a lot okay. of Thanks fun. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, we make a break. <coughs> 15 minutes and then we have, where's Sonia? Sonia. We have the Hugifort. We have a camera up, camera up there at 12.15. And at 2 o'clock, we're going to meet Imran Ahmad and talk a little bit about the cool things he's doing and answering questions all around photography, macro, wide angle, reverse lens, whatever. Going to be good. So see you in 15 minutes and Imran at 2 o'clock. Awesome. Thanks, Nuno. That was awesome. Cool. Thanks it. a lot. Yeah. It's